Chapter 7 Masculine Spirituality and Initiation The Global Challenge Address Summer 1995 I propose to share with you some of what I have discovered about the nature and dynamics of masculinity, the work of empowerment of the male soul, and its relationship to masculine initiation. In short, the great work we all share. I want to recall us to the center of our work and offer a map for our work, the work that we as men face today. I will begin by describing the psychological structure of masculinity, what I like to call the plumbing, the hard wiring. Then I will focus on where we are right now in this work. What time is it now? What do we face? How are we doing in the world? At that point, I will be able to explain some of the reasons why we are doing the things the way we are doing them. Then, I want to share with you a few reflections on what I think is needed in the way of an inclusive, pan-tribal, masculine brotherhood. The first thing I will do is pass this octahedron around and have each of you hold it. The meaning of this will become clear as we go. Put some good energy into it from your soul. I think this is a wonderful symbol of the God Self that is in each one of us. Even if all I say tonight is gibberish to you and totally confusing, your right brain will understand it if you just hold that octahedron for a minute. Your right brain will get it, then your left lane will eventually catch up. A journey to the center. Many of you heard the lecture I gave recently to the Chicago Men's Conference about masculine spirituality. When we talk about the sacred masculine and masculine spirituality, there are two components we need to discuss. The first component is for a man to get connected to the great power that he needs for life, that his family needs for him to have, that his community needs for him to have, that the world needs for him to have. Second, masculine spirituality concerns what a man must do to keep his power from turning demonic and destructive in his personality and life, in his family, in his community, and in the world. Masculine spirituality has these two parts. A man has to connect to the power, and he then must figure out how to keep that power from destroying him and his world. In the history of masculine spirituality, we haven't done well with the second one. We have at times been very good at powering up like the Nazi SS troops, but we have not always been effective in keeping our power from turning demonic. I have reasons to hope that we may be getting to that point where we might do better, and that is where I want us to lead us before the night is over. I want to share with you an image. I have a number of images I want to share with you, different images of the journey to the center. The center of the world. Throughout history, all forms of spirituality have understood the center as a source of power for living in the world. The first task of masculine spirituality is locating the center, connecting with it, plugging into the sources of regeneration and creativity that are needed for life. Here is an image from the work of the great scholar Mircea Iliadi. If you haven't read his book, The Sacred and the Profane, you should get it and read it. He is one of the most important people helping us to understand human spirituality. He has helped us to understand that when human beings cannot find the center, they fall into chaos. That chaos has different forms. It can be a cold chaos. You've all been depressed. You've all been without energy. A cold chaos of the wasteland. Or, if you don't know where the center is, you can have a hot chaos, a compulsive chaos, an addictive chaos, where you've got lots of energy banging off the walls and lighting you up like a Christmas tree but it's making your life crazy. It's destroying your world. Before you find that center, you either have cold or hot chaos in some way, and there's no space in the world that is habitable. We talk about a habitat for humanity. That is just a new way to talk about the old idea of finding a center so there can be a world that is habitable for humans who have found orientation. Iliadi called that the access Mundi. That's the world tree. In Christianity, it's the cross. In Judaism, it's the holy city of Jerusalem. In Islam, it's the Kaaba, the great black shrine. In Native American traditions, there are sacred mountains that are sacred centers, the center of the world. If you've been to the Southwest, you've probably been to the center of the world as some of the native peoples. The old people of the earth always knew that they had to find the center of the world. Why? Because they knew that if you did not find it, 
you would either fail to have the energy you needed to live, or any energy you had would be demonic. It would lead to craziness. So find that center, and in that center, when you find it, the power of being flows in through that center. It is there that creation forms out of chaos. It is there that the great I am is said. It is there that you return for generation when things begin to deteriorate. It is there that the creative regenerative energies of the world flow in ascent to the center. Diagram six in the appendix shows an image of the ascent to the center. In spirituality, and especially in masculine spirituality, the journey to the center and to the fruits of the center are imaged as an ascent. You see all kinds of examples of sacred mountains. Probably 50 cultures talked about pyramids and used pyramids to image this ascent, this spiritual ascent, the spiral toward the center. For just a moment, I want to talk about the transformative dynamics of that ascent and have you think about the way in which you are experienced and the experience you wish for other men is a walking of this journey, of this ascent. It moves from the wasteland that we saw before at the edge of the circle up to the center where you find cosmos, world, shalom, the sacred order of justice and peace. Now just let me take you through the stages in the illustration. Just work with me on this because this is the process you go through when you power up as you get more and more connected with your center as you get more and more connected with that gold energy in there, as you learn how to deal with your power. You see, it's easy as long as you're not connected to your power, but once you start getting connected, it gets more and more dangerous until the point where you are really cooking, and then you are at most risk. That's why I want us to go through this. For those of you men who are already really passionate and full of energy, remember when you were not, and when you were looking at other men who were the leaders you admired. We need to talk just a little bit about that dynamic. The Wasteland. So we start down here in the wasteland, in the chaos. Either the cold chaos or the hot chaos. Some of you majored in one or the other. I usually majored in the cold chaos. I spent so much time chronically depressed that I didn't even know I was depressed until I started feeling better. Sometimes, when you are in that condition, you do not believe there is a center. You don't believe there is any energy. You can't see any gold in the world. You don't believe there is any gold in the world, any God energy, because you do not see any light shining out there. This is where a lot of men find themselves today. They do not even see any gold out there to envy. This is one of the great horrors of our time, that so many men are cynical and nihilistic and have absolutely no hope. There can be no hope when you are here. Epiphany. But you know, the spirit moves on the face of the waters and there will be an epiphany. Something will shine. Now all kinds of things can shine. It can be female. It can be a wonderful bourbon. It can be a job. It can be a house, a place in the country. It can be Mexico. It can be another man. But suddenly, there is gold that shines for you and you can see that glint and suddenly everything has changed. Because you went all the way from not believing there was any such thing to actually seeing it shine. At this point, in your perception, gold is not within. The gold is out there. So that is the first step. That is the beginning of a chance for hope. It usually doesn't feel great because immediately you feel what contemporary French philosophers and psychoanalysts call the lack. They say the reason we want to sacrifice human beings is because of our lack. At this point, you move right to envy. I feel the lack, and I see that shine, and I will envy it, particularly if it is shining in another man. So have you got the dynamics? We refer to this in psychoanalysis today as idealization, or idealizing self-object transference. That's the technical language. It just means you look out there, and you see the gold. But you know it's not in you, and you think it's not for you. When you shine, as all you leaders know, the idealization is going to come your way. For those of you that are not leaders yet, your time will come when men will look at you and they see the gold shine. Then they will envy you because initially they did not believe they could ever have it. Then for a while they are going to hate you. 
I heard that there's a t-shirt in the network going around now that says leader on the front and has a target on the back. It's great. Yeah, I'll be passed around to everyone who is thinking about leadership or everyone who already is a leader because this is a fundamental dynamic that you will face. Arcing. The next stage is when you connect with that person, when you form a connection with the source of that shining. This happens a lot in your leadership work when that connection is made and a flow of energy begins. There is a technical term for that. It's called a tension arc. It's called arcing. Think about arc welding or think about the arcing that goes on in electro plating. This is the flow of energy. This is an arcing of energy. If there is not a connection point between you and that source of gold that you see, there is no arcing and you will not experience any transformation. But if there is a connection that love that from the heart connection, there's contact, and there is a beginning of a transfer of that gold, that shine. This is what is supposed to happen in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, that heart connection. Often it doesn't, but that is what is supposed to happen. If the relationship continues, then the one who felt he had no gold gradually notices his lead turning into gold. I didn't tell you about the bad part, that's the mana stage, what Carl Jung called the mana personality stage. When you first touch the gold, when you first realize the gold is in you, it blows you up like a balloon. You will feel like you can do anything, but you just have to hang on a little bit because the drop back to reality is coming soon. The good news is that if you stay with the relationship, if you got some men that love you enough to put up with you when you're in your mana personality stage, the arcing will continue. You have had a great experience. You have had your initiation. And now you think you know everything there is to know. You have all of these guys that love you in spite of all you think you know, and they continue loving you. Then that arcing continues and your radiance continues to grow. What was led gradually turns to gold and begins to shine more brightly. Creativity. As that radiance in the man continues to shine more brightly, he begins to feel his creativity flowing in him. This is when he becomes dangerous, because now all these streams of creativity are coming forth. The great philosopher Paul Tillich said that when the creativity starts flowing so strongly, it can begin to break the forms in the personality. That's what he called the demonic. The demonic is not bad energy. It is often wonderful energy that has started to break the forms because it is not contained or channeled adequately. Containment. A lot of work with men requires the creation of adequate containment. When that creativity starts flowing from being connected and all that powerful sacred masculine energy really starts to flow, then the demonic is breathing down your neck. This is why you have to have the community. The technical phrase is inadequate self-object milieu. This means your community helps you contain and channel your creativity. The people that love you have gotten past their hate of creative people because they've gotten more used to their own shining and they can help you affirm, contain, and channel your creativity. Community. When you have had that helpful kind of community around you enough, the good news is that you internalize that community. Your inner temple gets firmer. Your inner cup that can hold your energy. That is the good news. You internalize all those men that love you and they become part of the cup that helps you hold and channel that God energy. The bad news is that you never get to where you can handle it alone. This is a very important point. We'll see later that is happening now because men have been told that they ought to be able to handle it alone. The fact is, that the old peoples of the earth knew that men could not handle it alone. Men don't get so mature that they can handle it alone. It doesn't matter how many years of analysis they've had, they never get individuated enough to handle it alone. That is why we have to think about the community, containment, formation, and training ourselves how to channel and steward that energy. Cosmos. That brings us, in the old mythologies of the world, into building a habitat for humanity called cosmos in the mythologies. What is that energy for? What is the community stewarded for? It's stewarded for the polis, 
they used to say in Greece, the city and the cosmos, so that there can be a safe vessel for one's friends, for one's family, and for the rest of humanity. So here is the journey to the center and the ascent, the struggle of the ascent, and the goal of getting beyond the self and even beyond the community to cosmos, to world building, to a world of justice and peace. The structure of the psyche. The octahedron represents my discoveries and my work for almost three decades. There is enormous evidence to agree with Carl Jung that there is a great code about the journey to the center that is in our two million year old DNA. There are clues to the task of the journey to the center that are far more specific than many people believe. In my work, I have tried to present a decoding of the structure of the psyche. Many of you have read my books and listened to my tapes, so I'm not going to belabor this point, though we are talking about the male psyche. I want to take a few minutes to say how the female journey to the center is similar to the male journey to the center and how they are different, critically different. The Four Powers I agree with you that the four corners of mythology show the world being quadrated, that there are four corners of the world, four elements. The Navajo say there are four winds. The Hindus say there are four faces of God. The early Christians said there had to be four gospels. Jung said myths and mythic images are the faces that instincts bring to the world. Humans quadrate the world in mythic images, so there must be a fourfold instinctuality. Jung thought this referred to the fourfold typology of intuition, thinking, sensation, and feeling. I found out later that Tony Wolfe, his lover and teacher, thought it was something else. I find that I am in her tradition. She thought there were four structured forms of the female psyche, not four functions like Jung thought. I also think that there are four structural forms and that they correspond to the four energies in the human soul. Men and women alike have these four energies and the task of balancing them. In other words, the energies that men and women must learn first to access, then to balance in their individuation or in their pilgrimage, in their journey to the center, are the same four energies. But the way that men and women get to the center is not the same. That is the critical difference in our genetic plumbing that I think will help us understand why we are in the mess we're in today on this planet. Let me just go through these four powers. The king and queen. The mythic images of the king and queen represent an instinctual line having to do with nurture and centering in the human personality. I will talk about the initiation that goes with it later on. The line having to do with the inclusive nurture is what I call the royal line of development. Notice that the octahedron is two pyramids base to base a male pyramid and a female pyramid placed together. The male quarter set of books Doug Gillette and I wrote discusses this eightfold nature, the octahedron shape. Jung believed the structure of the deep self in men and women had the form of that octahedron. I'm simply offering a decoding of that octahedron. This royal energy of inclusive nurture and centering is important. Without it, you are not calm, you are not centered, you do not have a vision. You not have a sense of I am and I want. If someone held a 357 Magnum up to your head and said, tell me what you want or I'll shoot, would you be capable of giving an answer? A lot of men really want to know what they desire, but they can't find it. That is what the king image is all about. It is about achieving your sovereignty. To the lover. The mythic image of the lover represents another instinctual line of development that covers passion, sexuality, affiliation, intimacy, embodiment, and joy. If you don't have a connection with the lover within, you don't have any fun. No matter how smart you are, how caring you are in terms of your nurturance, without the lover being accessed, you don't have any fun and it doesn't feel worthwhile. You can thank D.H. Lawrence for being the high priest of this energy. What's that poem? Sooner murder an infant in its cradle than to nurse unacted desire. The idea is that if you are just building good works out of duty, it's terrible. That's the absence of the lover energy. Three, the magician. 
Mythic images of the magician, high priest or priestess represent the cognitive line of development. This has to do with moving from mere knowledge to wisdom used for healing of self and community. Notice that the cognitive line balances the nurturance line. This is the same in men and women. There's no difference here. In other words, it's just as hard to gain insight for men and women, just as hard to develop generativity and the capacity to bless and nurture for women as it is for men. We are alike in these ways. The warrior. The other axis of the octahedral code is where the bad divine joke is. Jung thought that God had a bad sense of humor. The reversal here in the male and female soul is one of the lover-warrior access. The lover energy we talked about. The warrior energy is the energy of focus, discipline, boundaries, service, and mission. Without a mature connection to this energy, a man will be passive, violent, or both. The asymmetry of male-female development. The symmetry we have here is that unlike males, young females are flooded with lover energy in adolescence. Notice I put adolescence, early adulthood, midlife, maturity, corresponding for men with warrior, magician, lover, king. But for women, I put it with lover, magician, warrior, queen. Here is the symmetry. I've said for a long time that men and women pass each other at midlife on this axis. This is the source of so many divorces and so many intergender misunderstanding. Just as the woman at midlife is powering up into her aggression, a man is discovering the opening of his heart. So they pass each other in the night, literally pass each other in the night. I want you to reflect upon how this difference is enormously significant. I want you to think about the asymmetrical life cycle trajectory in women and men. After I published this series of books, Someone told me about David Gutman's book, Reclaimed Powers. It is a cross-cultural study of men and women through the life cycle that gives empirical validation to my assertions about this cross-cultural movement of women to more aggression at midlife and men to more passivity. It's in the hardwiring of men and women and must be dealt with consciously and constructively. So here are the four foundational powers with one asymmetry. They have the same center but different trajectories for men and women. The four initiations. We are the social animal. We are the cultural animal. We are the ape that creates culture. You put our species down anywhere and we'll create myths and ritual. With those four foundational powers, we will create the software we need to actualize our hardware. The potential in our hardware. If you give us long enough, we will create what we need. We will create initiations through culture which correspond to each of these instinctual lines. In other words, our species is not simple. We are very complex. We are a very souped up chimpanzee and we need a lot of software to go with our biological hardware. So in the past, indigenous tribes created initiations that corresponded to each of these four lines of development. We're going to see a little bit later what has happened to us that gets us to where we are now, but here is the continuing challenge of our species. First, men in the past were taught things to do that created a royal initiation that helped them get to their point where they could bless. Men did things together that helped them learn how to mentor. Men did things together that helped them to be aware of the need to sacrifice for the whole. And they didn't leave this to chance. This is the key thing. They didn't have our contemporary assumptions that you just let a person grow up and they'll somehow become mature. None of the indigenous peoples made that mistake. Second, Gutman's book also makes it clear that the old peoples of the earth, the tribal peoples, all knew that you needed to initiate the warrior in a young man. Otherwise, that aggression energy in a young man would damage his community and probably himself. So they came up with software, tribal initiations, from the Maasai to the Zulu to the Zuni, helping the young male learn what his aggression was for, because he has to, so early in his life, before he has enough life experience to tell him how to use it wisely. Compare that to the experience of the woman who lives much longer before being flooded with aggression. Third, the old peoples of the earth did not just 
have an ordained clergy. They had software for men in understanding initiation. Men learned their ritual responsibilities, their role as a magician. There was no such thing as a man in a tribe of indigenous peoples that didn't have his ritual responsibility, that did not take his place in the circle of men in the longhouse. You should go to the Museum of Natural History in Chicago and look at the longhouses that men were in prior to the modern area. They all knew that there had to be some sort of initiation, some sort of ritual software for a man's responsibility in ritual leadership. Finally, the ancient peoples who knew a man needed to power up in the erotic, and they knew that this erotic energy was the universal solvent. Without a lover initiation, it will dissolve anything, personalities, homes, fortunes, relationships. We will not ask for any testimonials on this. So there you are, your four initiations, the four aspects of initiation corresponding to the four powers. The role of the elder. All the old peoples of the earth knew that these powerful energies needed to be brought online, contained, channeled, and that men should not be thrown onto their own devices on this. They should have help from other men, especially from the elders. There were elders who carried the wisdom, and these elders were men who understood the wisdom of the tribe. For many of the tribes, this wisdom went back thousands of years into prehistory. So this is the inherited plumbing that we have as men, and the old peoples of the earth had a sense that you must create myth and ritual to help contain, channel, access, and regulate these energies. This is our past, and according to Carl Jung and Anthony Stevens and others, this past goes back into our evolutionary prehistory. This is the history of masculine spirituality. These are the energies that all men have to reconnect with and learn how to regulate and contain. This is our heritage. Audience member. What is the framework or container for all of this? More. For most of the old peoples of the earth, these issues were not seen as merely psychology. Theirs was a holistic approach. These concerns were not cut off from the spiritual and ethical vision of the tribe. So all these agendas were related to the mission from the center. They went to the center to connect with all this energy, but it was never seen as private in other words, this wasn't something you just went to your analyst for to get you powered up so you could be a better executive, be more successful in your career, and then retire and play golf. This was not their vision. All of these concerns were seen as integrated, a spiritual world, a spiritual cosmos. All of these energies were stewarded. Once they were accessed, they were stewarded for the larger whole, for the cosmos. This is the critical distinction between the old traditions and what has happened to us in the modern world. Initiation at Midlife Let's talk a little bit about this midlife transition. We need to get really clear about this midlife dynamic and how different our midlife dynamic is from that of women. There's enormous heart work being done in the new warrior network, opening up for men's heart and working with men at midlife in this heart work area. I think the genius of the founders forming this vision in the early days was not to call this the New Lover Network. We need to think about this now. Why not call it the New Lover Network? Men's hearts are opening up. One of the things we need to talk about together is this abyss, this male midlife emotional swamp. They used to call this the slow of despond in Renaissance poetry. For you folks who are not from the south, a slow is an old creek that is full of water moccasins. It's hot and wet and full of quicksand. The research shows that men move into midlife and they become depressed, passive, suicidal, and addictive worldwide. Did you hear that? Depressed, suicidal, addictive worldwide. You can just see this bad joke. Men at midlife move right into that heart energy, into that lover energy, and then many of them collapse in a puddle of jello. I've seen green berets that get to midlife and throw away everything they have ever learned about the warrior. Why do we need to concern ourselves with a warrior initiation at midlife? 
because even if a man had a good warrior initiation in his first half of life, he is in danger of losing connection with it because of his developmental programming. You've also got people like me to follow a trajectory more like that of a woman because of the way my family was. I knew that they were attacking my brother's warrior when he showed it, so I moved into the little trickster pattern. Some of you are academics and therapists. You know what I mean. You think you can bypass the warrior task by moving right into that trickster. You're smart and you think everything is good and fine and you've got that big grin on your face. Then you try to find a relationship and you wonder what the heck is wrong with you. You don't seem to be able to form adequate boundaries in relationships. The bad news is even if you were a Green Beret, you can get to this place in your life, moving over this midlife threshold and completely forget that you ever had any aggression. Even if you remember that you did, you are ashamed of it. You're ashamed you ever had it. It's good to move into a new room in the house of the soul. The bad news is that when you move into the lover space without an initiation, it will dissolve everything that you ever tried to build. Everything that you ever thought you knew goes right out the door. We could have some testimonials to this, couldn't we? Talk about our elder problem, now look at this. When the time comes for us males to accept the mantle of generativity and inclusive caring and empowerment of young men helping them deal with their fiery fire in the valley warrior energies about the time when we are needed for that we have become passive depressed and ineffectual another difference between men and women you and i know that there are a lot of women who have contempt for their husbands because their husbands have moved into this midlife limbo and are confused and disoriented when women get to midlife, they say to themselves, I've had enough of this servant stuff for other people. I've learned about boundaries now. I've figured out how I have been taken advantage of. Now I'm going to get very clear about what I want. And if this pitiful excuse for a man that I'm married to doesn't get his stuff together, I'm going to leave him. And they are ready for that. They have warrior virtues at that point, but their husbands have lost them. It goes like this. She says, just do it and stop whining. He says, but I feel, but I want, couldn't we? Then she says, just get out of the way. I've got stuff I've got to do. So she decides to take the helm. She is not feeling wimped out and she is not overwhelmed with feelings of, oh, this is painful or this is uncomfortable or what will they think or will she leave me? When she comes up, she has that warrior energy that says, let's get the job done. I know what I want. I know where I'm going. If you can't come along, then I'll find somebody else. Can you follow this? This is the radical asymmetry. When you look in the world and when you look at Gutman's book, you notice that women elders are not having a hard time finding their responsibilities. They're still having a difficult time, but not as hard a time as male elders. Why? The female initiation is not in much better shape than male initiation. According to Gutman, they do better because they are not in a pool of feelings when challenged with responsibilities, while men at midlife are in that slow of despond. Assuming the mantle of elder. When you talk to a midlife male about signing on to be an elder for the new warrior network and really building this organization, he says, Man, I'm here to get my own wounds healed, and as soon as I can get my wounds healed, I'm going to be moving on. This is why so many men at midlife treat their men's organization like a cult. The research shows that most of the folks going into these cultic organizations move in, stay about three years while they heal, and then move on. So you can see the temptation in men's work in our time. I'm not just speaking of the new warrior network. I'm speaking about the whole international men's movement. Why has the men's movement been such a wimped out, largely disappointing phenomenon? You know, in 1990, we had big dreams and we had so much lover energy we couldn't organize our way out of a paper bag. And you can see why. There is no shame in healing wounds at all, but it's very difficult in that space to deal with talk about assuming the mantle of eldership. 
It's very difficult for men in the process of being healed to think about containing it for other men following them and also creating space, tradition, and instinctual sources for young men who haven't even come to midlife yet. This is the challenge. This is the difficulty. You see that asymmetry here it is not the same for women and for men. Consider how this dynamic gets behind the situation we find ourselves in, in terms of masculine spirituality on our planet, in terms of the situation in our cities, in terms of our building prisons. Why are we building prisons? It's all related to this. The challenge of global brotherhood. Forces of chaos in the world. I want to talk just a little bit about what time it is. We've looked at the evolutionary plumbing. Now I want to talk about where we are, and then I want to talk about why I wanted to come and speak to the leaders of this organization. First, a little bit about the situation we're in. Here I feel a bit like Winston Churchill must have felt back in the summer of 1940, knowing Hitler wanted to invade Britain by the end of the year. I've studied his life, and I've often wondered what it was like for him to give those famous speeches. If you haven't heard them, you ought to listen to some of them. He had, a, he had a counter a kind of passivity and hopelessness that threatened to overwhelm the whole Western world. For example, after Dunkirk, he addressed Parliament on June 4th, 1940, to explain that his resolve to keep on fighting was based on serious grounds and was no mere despairing effort. But listen to a sample of his energy. Even though large tracts of Europe have fallen into the grip of the Gestapo, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas and oceans. We shall fight in the air. We shall defend our island. Whatever the cause may be, we shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Speeches like this were probably the most important of his life, trying to get people to figure out what time it was in Europe in 1940. That is why I feel that my discussion with you tonight is so important. I may never make another presentation that is more important than this one, not just in terms of presentation itself, but in terms of the importance of the topic and the possibilities that are here in this group of men. I love to study World War II to learn about leadership and command. I think the summer of 1942 was the most critical period in the struggle of the Second World War. The Allied powers were still very weak. They were unprepared. They were unorganized. They didn't have their leadership lined up. They didn't have their resources lined up. They didn't know what they were going to do. It was a desperate situation. Those of you who know about this think back with me to the summer of 1942. The ovens were going into full speed in the concentration camps. The high-tech German war machine was humming. Hitler's panzer divisions were having a field day. On the Eastern Front, the Russian armies were in retreat. In North Africa, Rommel's army was sweeping toward Egypt. On the Western Front, and the Luftwaffe was still a terrifying force and German submarines were daily sinking Allied ships all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. In the Asian theater, a handful of Allied soldiers in various places were being chewed to bits by an incredibly sophisticated war machine run by a regressive form of masculine spirituality. Both fronts were being run by demonic, racist, tribal masculine spiritualities in high key. If we had time, we could talk about the men who started collecting themselves a little bit, talking to each other, starting to figure out what to do about the situation, starting to think about what they need to do to get off the defensive and onto the offenses. We could talk about Operation Torch, which was a first strike led at their underbelly by General George S. Patton Jr., or St. George as I call him. This was the beginning of the change in the direction of the war. Our time today more subtle, but the forces of chaos and destruction on our planet are far greater now than they were in 1940 or 1942, and most people are in massive denial about it. The Deculturization of the World Some months ago, 
The Atlantic Monthly ran an article about the deculturalization of the world. We have a new form of chaos on the planet now that has never been seen before. It's a form of chaos that comes not when the culture has the wrong leaders in its place of eldership and a change is needed, but a new form of chaos where the whole system of elders has collapsed and the culture is falling apart and dissolving into chaos. You see it in Somalia and you see it increasingly in many places on the earth. Another article has just come out in the Atlantic Monthly focusing more on our cities and about the energy chaos in our cities. The enormous increase in violent crime and murder, especially among our young, especially among our young males. This agrees perfectly with Gutman's research. We are seeing all over the planet a new thing that is more horrible than the Nazi and Japanese war machines ever thought about being. After the war, we put teams of people in Japan under Douglas MacArthur to inject democratic institutions into their systems. We did the same thing in Germany and Italy. But recent events of terrorism and ethnic violence show how easily that structure could dissolve between our fingers. The structure that is needed to hold things together or to create any institutional change. Our uninitiated warriors, our monster boy warriors, Running the gun trade in the world are making it easy for 10 year old boys to have AK 47s and M 16s all over the planet. Monster boy gangs are increasingly dominating community after community, city after city, all over the world, not just in America. I wish it was only our problem, but it's not. Boys, unaldered boys, uninitiated boys, abandoned by their uninitiated fathers and uncles are terrorizing people in New Guinea, in South America, in El Salvador, as if the people of El Salvador haven't had enough misery. Now we are exporting our LA gangs to San Salvador. The gang boys of San Salvador are being educated by made in America monster boys. The lack of masculine initiation. Gentlemen, the time is late. This is a desperate situation and we have to look around and see what's being done about it. Look around at your mayors and your governors and your congress and your justice department and listen for anybody who is going to step up and name the role of masculine initiation or the lack of it in this worldwide phenomenon. You're going to listen a long time before you hear anybody talking about this who knows what's going on. This body of men here, because of their experience, have ways to understand what's going on, but it's amazing to me. I look and listen to a lot of would-be leaders in a lot of walks of life and it's amazing how few have any clue that it's not merely economics, it's not merely education, it's not merely any particular social location or television show or rap song. No, these problems result from the lack of system of masculine initiation and eldership. Gutman's book says, in every indigenous culture, the older men bonded together as peace chiefs. They bonded with the young men to help them understand what all that aggression is for. But look at this now. In our culture, our older men are declaring moral bankruptcy in these matters. I don't think it has to be this way. Look at your organization. You have some men who are functioning effectively as elders. They are full of that generative power, that king energy that has taken them so long to develop. They have not forgotten what it is to use a sword, and they are not sociopathic tricksters. They have a sense of what knowledge is for. They have some wisdom for healing, and they are willing to steward it. Their hearts have been opened up. They are not the same sadistic young guys they might have been at one time. They have been able to look at their own sadism in the eye and been able to change. They are not white knights anymore. They know they are not pure. They are not red knights anymore either, for they know that they are not so righteous, that they have been violent. They are black knights, the highest initiation of a man in the warrior image. They are men who have eaten some ashes. They have eaten their shadow to the point where they can responsibly use that energy. They bring the heart, they bring the wisdom, they bring it all to the elder task these men as elders help young men find their way in your organization. I'll come back to the promise of your organization in a moment, but let me continue with my point. 
the disappearance of elders. Gutman says that elders are disappearing all over the planet. The same men that used to carry the responsibilities of the elder are now alcoholic, or thinking about suicide, or they are in major depressions, or they are on golf courses, or all of the above. When these men abandon these young males, we get what we have now. In other words, this stuff makes sense. All these pundits in our society are trying to figure out what is going on and why. But they avoid the one key factor. It is clear what is going on and why. No longer do we have a problem about fighting it out. We have all these people in leadership positions in every walk of life, especially these involved with the legal system, criminology, and the political life, who are trying to explain the situation without any reference to male initiation or maturation. It is impossible. It cannot be done. You cannot even identify the problem without looking at male initiation, much less fix it. So what time is it? It is a time when men have abdicated their responsibilities as elders wholesale. We have all these self-righteous men all over the country who want to put all these young boys in prison forever and throw away the keys because they are criminals and cannot be helped. This is the situation we face so-called grown men who will not face their own shadows. They will not face their own abdication. They are willing to throw away the lives of thousands upon thousands of young males all over the country and refuse to take any responsibility for it. That's where we are today, gentlemen. That's what time it is for men in the world today, for our families, communities, for our planet. An order of Earth Knights. That gets me to the question of what we need to solve this problem. Personally, I think we need a brotherhood, what used to be called an order. What kind of brotherhood do we need? First, let's consider what kind of brotherhood we don't need. We don't need a clone of the Nazi SS troops. Why not? They were organized. They knew how to use technology. They knew how to use spirituality. They knew how to use mythology. They knew how to use ritual. They knew how to inspire men. They knew how to get men committed unto death. They knew how to make men proud. So what was their problem? They had a racist, tribal, demonic vision. They made the fatal error that our forebears have repeatedly fallen into over thousands of years, what Eric Erickson called pseudo-speciation. We have not been able to keep the unity of our species on the screen or to make it the basis of our vision. If I had time, I'd go into it more. But we make the same mistake over and over. We take these magnificent young warriors and offer them a bogus vision, a tribal, demonic, racist, non-inclusive vision to serve and die for. I am the descendant of a magnificent Confederate cavalry officer. He was seduced by and gave his warrior energy to an unworthy cause. All through the history of our species, we have been doing this to our young warriors. We have been sacrificing these young, magnificent men to tribal visions. We must break new ground, follow a new path. Stewarding the vision. What do we need? We need magnificent young men, metal-aged men, and older men serving an inclusive vision worthy of them. We need to take that energy, that warrior energy that is very likely the most noble thing in the male soul, and bring it into the service of an inclusive, non-racist, non-sectarian, non-cultic vision of a world of justice and peace. Do you know what I mean? Speak to our brothers and the promise keepers. Warn them about the way they are repeating the error of our forefathers bringing all that wonderful masculine energy and serving another tribal vision. We have so many well-intentioned men today who have been seduced into racist militias because they know that warrior energy is important. The only elders and guides they have are men that do not have a clue except to repeat the errors of the past. What do we need? We need a group of people to bring forth a vision worthy of all these magnificent young men, red, yellow, black, and white. We need to have that vision lifted up, but we don't just put out a vision. We need more than a vision. We need an order, a brotherhood that is willing to do what is necessary to steward that vision and to provide that containment that is necessary for initiation into such a comprehensive vision of manhood. 
We don't need an organization that simply provides a place for men to go through their midlife crisis and leave. We need an organization that will take a young man and power him up and introduce him to how magnificent he is. We need an organization that will surround a man with other men that love him when he hits that white water at about age 40, that will help him understand what is happening to him, that will try to keep him from hitting the rocks. But if he does, we'll love him and pull him out. We need an organization that will be there for a man when he gets into his 50s and 60s and starts running into some health problems. One that will help him understand the many ways he is still strong, maybe even stronger than when he was younger and physically strong. We need an organization that will love a man when he is dying and be there for him while he is dying. We need an organization that a man can know will carry on after his death the work he was committed to. We need an organization that will help that man's family bury him and then be there to offer guidance to his children. This is an intergenerational vision. Is it new? No. This is the way men used to do it. This is the way it used to be done in the tribes. What is different about now? What is new? Horses of power. I've been looking around now for several years, especially since about 1987 when I first began really looking at all the evil in the world and trying to face up to it. I've been looking around for horses of power that the men of the world might ride, but you know what? I hate to tell you this, but there are not very many of them out there. I'd like to say to your members that I get to see in Chicago, I wish you guys had more competition. The news is that, unfortunately, you don't have very much competition. I look at you and I see the possibilities, but I have a question in my mind about this. I've listened to you guys and you talk about being warriors, and you talk about being new warriors. What is new about the new warriors? The old warriors were tribal warriors. They were courageous, they were magnificent, and they were glorious but they were fighting for tribal visions that were not as large as the human species. When I look around at the new warriors, I see something interesting here. New warriors don't exclude people because of different spiritual traditions. In fact, they welcome them. New warriors don't exclude men because they come from different races. In fact, they are trying to reach out their arms and become much more inclusive racially as a movement. In my city of Chicago, a lot of people talk good game but do you know who is trying to step up to the plate and work with young black men in Hales Franciscan High School? It has been men from the New Warrior Network who have put themselves on the line there. I'm just looking, I'm just observing. Don't blame me if I look at you guys and see a group of men who know how important masculine initiation is, who know what happens to men when they don't get it who are doing their best to be inclusive across economic class, across religions, across races. This is new. This is a new kind of warrior. I said that we need an order. Forrest Craver likes to talk about the need for an order of earth. An order is an organization of the kind we have been talking about, committed to provide containment and whatever is necessary to get this job done. An order is something that men develop an allegiance to for the long haul, not just for three years. To become part of an order is a lifelong commitment. Are you the one? Do you remember the gospel story where disciples come from John the Baptist who is in prison and ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? To be honest with you, I have to say to you this weekend is this, we are in deep trouble and I wish there were a lot of other organizations to talk to. If there were, I would go talk to them because I am worried about this. I have not been blessed with any children, if anything that has made me more concerned about yours. If we do not create something like an order of earth, we do not have a snowball's chance in hell. If we do find one, we still might not make it but we would at least have a fighting chance and we could give them hell for a while. I wrote about this vision of an Earth Night Network in my book, The Warrior Within. My question is very simple. Are you the order that we long for or should we look for another? Are you the inclusive order, the non-racist order, 
the non-classist order, the non-sexist order, the committed order that we long for. If you don't believe we long for it, just go to the movies. They make movies about these longings all the time. Recently I sent a packet of stuff to Steven Seagal with a little challenge. I sent it through one of those martial arts brothers. The message went something like this. You play a good Earth Knight in the movies, but are you interested in really being one? I never heard from him. Maybe I still will. But folks, this is the issue. You do fantastic work. I've analyzed a lot of men who have benefited greatly from your work. I have worked with men from years who have been locked up in themselves, in their old anal ways. They were not able to get free, no matter how much work they did. I have seen them go to a new warrior weekend and then break out. So I have seen the redemptive power of your work and healing. If you never did anything else but continue the kind of work you are doing right now, you would be a success and people would be grateful to you. But I want to raise you the question, is it possible that you have an even wider mission? Could it be that in the 25th century, some elder is going to be telling a story like this to a group of children? It came to pass in the later years of the 20th century that a small band of men of different races from different walks of life woke up, looked around, and saw what time it was. They saw how desperate the situation was and how bad the odds were that they could do the work that needed to be done, but they nevertheless said yes to the challenge. Children, though we cannot remember their names, we are eternally grateful to them.